And, and people who ignore this are going to be washed away. What? Our next guest is sounding the alarm that Silicon Valley and the West have lost their way. Joining us right now is Alex Carr, Palantir CEO and co-founder. His first book is out this morning, The Technological Republic, Hard Power, Soft Belief, and the Future of the West. Welcome back, everybody, for another deep dive. This time we're digging into a book that's causing a bit of a stir. It's called The Technological Republic. Yeah, it's uh, it's pr provocative. It is by Alexander Karp. Yeah. And Nicholas Vamitska. Alexander Karp, he's the CEO of Palantir. Uh huh. Now I know that name rings a bell for a lot of you. That's the company that specializes in data analysis, often for like government intelligence and things like that. Right. Pretty powerful stuff. Um, and they've written this book. It's not just a tech book. It's about a lot more. What would you say it's about? Well, they basically argue that the West is in a crisis. Okay, a crisis. That's a strong word. What kind of crisis? A crisis of purpose and innovation. They say Silicon Valley, which you'd think is all about progress in the future. Right. Supposedly. Yeah, yeah. It has kind of lost its way. It's shifted from like big, ambitious, world-changing inventions to just chasing consumer trends. So instead of, I don't know, putting a man on the moon or inventing the internet, we're getting... Exactly, yeah. We're getting more addictive social media apps, more ways to waste time. They call this shift soft belief. Like, we've become obsessed with these little trends and quick profits instead of solving real problems. So they're saying it's kind of shallow, like we're focused on the shiny surface stuff instead of the deep, meaningful challenges. Yeah, like we're all hype about the metaverse, right? While China's pouring resources into stuff like quantum computing. You know, those computers that are supposed to be, like, insanely powerful. Yeah, and hypersonic missiles. Exactly. Hypersonic missiles that could travel, like, five times the speed of sound makes the metaverse seem a little less urgent doesn't it yeah a little bit okay so wait are you saying that silicon valley used to be different oh totally after world war ii silicon valley was all about collaborating with the government they saw technology as a way to you know build the nation to solve big problems huh so it wasn't always about just making money no it was about things like national security take gps for example yeah. that came out of the military but now you use it to find the nearest Starbucks. Right. Or the internet itself. Oh, that's right. The internet came from. Government-funded research. Huh. Okay, so if it was all about national progress and big goals back then, when did things change? Like, was there a specific moment when this soft belief thing took over? It's hard to pinpoint, you know, one exact moment. But the authors argue that the dot-com bubble in the late 90s played a big role. The dot-com bubble. Yeah, all that hype about internet companies, valuations going through the roof. Suddenly, it was all about quick profits and getting rich fast. They even use the term innovation theater. Innovation theater. What does that even mean? It's like, you know, all flash and no substance, focusing on these flashy tech advancements that don't really solve any meaningful problems. So basically, we're all distracted by the shiny new toys, while the real game is being played somewhere else. Pretty much. And it's not just a tech problem either. They say it's a cultural problem. Cultural. Yeah, like the soft belief mentality is affecting everything. The way we consume information, the way we think about the future, our attention spans. You know what? That actually makes a lot of sense. Like we're constantly bombarded with new apps, new gadgets, new updates. It's hard to focus on the big picture when there's always a new distraction popping up on your phone. Exactly. And that's exactly the point they're making, that this whole cultural shift has made the West kind of complacent. Complacent. Yeah, and that it could make us vulnerable to rivals like China who are playing the long game. Okay, so that's a pretty sobering thought. So if the golden age of government-funded innovation is over uh -huh. and Silicon Valley is too busy chasing trends, Yeah. What do we do? Like, what's the solution here? Well, that's where things get really interesting. The authors have a pretty radical proposal. Oh, radical. Yeah, but uh, I think we should save that for the next part of our deep dive. <laughs> Got to keep you on the edge of your seat. All right, we'll be right back after a short break. Don't go anywhere. All right, so before the break, we were talking about the technological republic and this pretty radical solution that Karp and Zemiska propose for kind of like jump-starting Western innovation again. Right, yeah. Spill the beans. What is it? Okay, well, they basically call for a reboot of the arsenal of democracy. Arsenal of democracy. Hmm. I feel like I've heard that before. What is that? It's a term from World War II. Oh, okay. Back then, you know, America had to ramp up its industrial production, like, big time to support the war effort, right? Like factories that were making cars yeah. switched to making tanks. Gotcha. And so Carp and Zemiska want to see that same kind of national focus, but this time it's for, like, critical technologies. So instead of tanks and planes, we're building... Uh, Quantum computers. Oh. Hypersonic missiles. Okay, like the stuff that China is developing. 
Exactly. Yeah. They argue that the government needs to step up and like directly fund research and development in these key areas. They even suggest, you know, a national venture capital fund. Oh, wow. Specifically for dual use technologies. So stuff that has both civilian and military applications. So you could use it for either, huh? That's interesting. Okay, hold on a second, though. Wouldn't this be like crazy expensive and wouldn't it mean more government control over what gets invented? I mean, I feel like a lot of people might not be so comfortable with that. The book acknowledges those concerns, but they argue that the cost of inaction is even greater. Like if the West falls behind in these critical technologies, right. we could lose our, you know, economic and military edge. <laughs> right. And we could become vulnerable to, you know, countries like China. OK, I see what they're saying. But even if we buy into this whole idea, like is an arsenal of democracy really the right approach? I mean, that was wartime. This is I don't know. It just feels different. Yeah, and that's a valid point. And there are definitely critics who say that this level of government intervention would stifle innovation, you know? Yeah, yeah. It'd create this bureaucratic nightmare yeah. that the market is still the best way to, you know, drive progress. Right, so let Silicon Valley keep doing its thing, hope for the best. I don't know if I find that very reassuring, though. Yeah, and that's why this book is so, you know, thought-provoking. Yeah. It really forces us to ask some hard questions about the balance between the government and the market, you know? national security versus individual freedom, what kind of future do we really want? Right, right. Makes you think. You mentioned earlier that Elon Musk actually praised this book. That's kind of surprising to me. I mean, he's all about disrupting government, doing his own thing with SpaceX and Tesla. Yeah, well, it's not that surprising if you think about it. Like mm. SpaceX, for example, yeah. often benefits from government contracts. That's true. Partnerships. Uh -huh. And I think he shares that concern that the West is becoming complacent. Yeah, that was one of the things that they talked about in the book, for sure. Right, right. Like, we need a jolt. Yeah. A sense of urgency. A Stay ahead. Okay, so maybe there is some, some common ground there. But even if we buy into this arsenal of democracy thing, how do we actually make it happen? That's where it gets tricky. The book has some, you know, broad recommendations. Right. But the details get a little fuzzy. Like, they talk about attracting global talent. Yeah. But they don't really say, okay, what does that mean for immigration policy, right? Yeah. How do we compete with China, who is also trying to you know, right. Yeah. Recruit skilled workers. Yeah, I can see that getting kind of messy politically. <laughs> Probably a good time to remind our listeners, by the way, that we are simply unpacking the arguments presented in the technological republic. Right. Yeah. Not necessarily endorsing every single thing they say. Absolutely. This is about understanding the book's perspective, you know, and the broader conversation that they're trying to start. Right. Right. So big picture. What would you say is the main takeaway for our listeners here? What should they be thinking about after this deep dive? I think the biggest question this book poses is, do we have the collective will to act? Oh, wow. Like, can we as a society in democracies like ours yeah. muster the same level of focus and urgency that we saw during, you know... Wartime. Yeah, like wartime. Wow. And it's a pretty big question. It is a big question, yeah. And it goes way beyond just technology, right? Yeah, yeah. It is about values. It's about priorities. It's about our values, our priorities, what we want the future to look like. Absolutely. You know, the technological republic is like a call to action. Yeah. It's urging us to, you know, engage in this debate, think critically about how we want to shape the future of technology, and in turn, the future of, you know, the West. I like that. That's a really powerful thought. And it definitely makes me think about the role that we all play in all of this and this whole tech revolution that's happening around us. And that's the point. The book encourages us to be more than just passive consumers of technology. Right. You know, to be informed citizens who actively participate in shopping its development and its impact. Well said. I think we've covered a lot of ground here, but there's always more to explore. Let's move out to the final part of our deep dive and see how the technological republic kind of wraps up its argument. We're back and, you know, thinking about all this, I just remembered, uh, Carp and Zemiska, they said something about Silicon Valley's culture being part of the problem too, right? Oh, yeah, totally. They have this whole section in the book where they talk about what they call the culture of soft belief. Right. And how it's not just in the tech world anymore, it's everywhere. Okay, so remind me, what is soft belief again? It's this uh, this tendency to focus on like the short term, the easy rewards. Okay. Instead of tackling the big challenges, the things that take you know real effort. Right. Like think about it. It's like constantly refreshing your social media feed. You know, waiting for that next little dopamine hit. Right. Right. 
instead of, I don't know, learning a new skill or grappling with complex ideas. Yeah, so it's not just about the products that they're making. It's about the mindset that Silicon Valley promotes. Exactly. Yeah, they say this mindset is basically spreading like a virus. The virus, no. Yeah, and it's affecting everything from our attention spans to how we talk about politics, you know? It's creating this culture of instant gratification and superficial engagement. You know, I think they might be right. I can kind of see that. Like, we're losing our ability to just focus, think deeply, be patient. Right. Everything has to be fast and easy and entertaining. And they argue that this is a huge problem, not just for like individuals, right. but for society as a whole. Okay. It's making it harder to solve those big complex problems, right? The ones that need sustained effort and long-term thinking. Yeah, like climate change or global instability. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so if this soft belief is so pervasive, how do we get out of it? Like we can't all just delete our social media and suddenly become deep thinkers overnight, right? Right. It's not about like going off the grid or anything. It's more about being mindful, you know, like being aware of how we're engaging with technology and the culture that it creates. OK. Choosing to like prioritize depth over distraction. Right. Right. And maybe demanding more from our leaders and institutions. Exactly. Yeah. OK. So they are saying that individuals can make a difference or is this more about like top down change, you know, with the government leading the way? I think it's both, actually. The book argues for like a multi-pronged approach. Okay. You know, we need a shift in both individual mindsets and institutional priority. Gotcha. So the government needs to play a stronger role in shaping tech development, right? Like directing it towards solving those grand challenges. Right. But individuals also need to make conscious choices about how they use and interact with technology. Yeah, that makes sense. It reminded me, you mentioned earlier that CARP and Zemiska want to attract global talent oh yeah as part of their solution how does that fit in with this soft belief problem oh that's a great point yeah they argue that silicon valley has become too insular okay too focused on its own bubble you know and it's lost sight of the bigger picture so by yeah. attracting people from different backgrounds different perspectives right you can shake things up a bit break out of that soft belief cycle right and bring in fresh ideas fresh ambitions it's like a cultural exchange program but for innovation right exactly and it's not just about bringing in engineers and scientists either it's about building a culture of collaboration, intellectual curiosity, you know, one that values long-term impact over just making a quick buck. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm starting to get the whole picture now. It's not just about building fancy gadgets. It's about changing how we think about technology's role in society. Yeah, that's it. The technological republic is really calling for a total paradigm shift, you know, a new way of looking at the West's relationship with technology. Mm -hmm. It's about reclaiming that spirit of innovation, but not just for profit, but for the betterment of, you know, humanity. Wow, this has been a really thought-provoking deep dive. I got to say this book has given me a lot to think about. What about you, listener? Have you read The Technological Republic? It resonated with you. What are your thoughts on all this? Yeah, definitely share your thoughts with us on social media. We'd love to hear your take and keep this conversation going. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it really gets into, like, how tech and society should be working together. Should be, right? Keyword there. Yeah, should be. Yeah, it makes you wonder, like, are we doing it right? You know, I mean, that's the big question the book's trying to answer. It is. And it makes you think back to like, I don't know, think putting a man on the moon. Oh, yeah. That was a huge deal. A national priority. And the Internet, even I mean, early Internet, that wouldn't be here without, you know, government funding. Right. Like big, ambitious projects, that kind of vision. Does it even exist anymore? That's what the book digs into. It does. And it's kind of, I don't know, sobering. A little bit. Because the argument is. We've kind of shifted right away from those big moonshot type things. Mm -hmm. And now it's all about what they call soft beliefs. Yeah, soft beliefs. <laughs> it's like chasing the latest shiny object. Hey, where's the substance? Right. Like, are we pushing boundaries? Or just kind of obsessed with gadgets? The book actually uses the metaverse as an example. All this money poured into, what, virtual real estate? Well, we've got real problems here in the you know real world. Yeah, like that energy crisis. That kind of sums up the whole soft beliefs thing, doesn't it? It really does. It's about a lack of focus. Like we've drifted away from, you know, actually solving things. And the authors tie that right back to how the government funds R&D or doesn't. Exactly. We're losing that edge, that like national push to innovate that we used to have. OK, so the book, it's not all sunshine and roses, is it? Not exactly a celebration, no. But it's not just complaining. It offers solutions, too. Right. It does. It's like this idea of bold techno politics. 
Sounds kind of intense. It's meant to be. It's about, you know, shaking things up. But what does that even look like in, you know, real life? Okay, imagine. The government creates this huge fund, and it's only for clean energy solutions. Oh, wow. They just cut through the bureaucracy, bring in the absolute best minds, give them the resources they need. And just let them go at it. Exactly. That's bold techno politics. Okay, I'm starting to get it. But wouldn't that be risky? Like so much money? What if it doesn't work? The book talks about that. It's not about throwing cash at any random idea. It's about having like smarter systems. Oh, okay. For funding high risk stuff, sure. But high reward too. Think, uh, you know, DARPA. But for like... 21st century problems. I like that. So what else is in this bold technopolitics plan? Big one is we got to fix our priorities. Stop chasing fads, you know, and actually solve real problems. Give me some examples. Cybersecurity, for one. Climate change, obviously. Pandemics. I mean, we just had one. Yeah, we learned that the hard way. Right. That's where our talent and money should be going, not the next, you know, whatever's trending on social media. Back to the moonshots, stuff that actually matters. Exactly. So how do we do that? I remember the book talked about a talent gap. Oh, yeah, big time. We're not attracting the best minds like we used to. You mean like globally? Globally. Think about post-World War II. The U.S. was like the place to be for scientists. Yeah, we built so much from that. It wasn't an accident. It was a deliberate effort to, you know, recruit the top people. We got to get back to that. So we need focus, support for research, global talent. But there's more to it, isn't there? Oh, yeah. The book gets into this whole crisis of trust thing. It's how tech is developing, you know. Like every time there's some cool new thing, it's followed by a privacy scandal. It's deeper than that, though. It's like the more the tech world focuses on profit, the less trust there is in institutions, dot experts, even progress itself. OK, so why should I, the average person, care about this? Think about it. You're online trying to have a conversation about, say, climate change. What happens? Probably ends up a shouting match. Exactly. Echo chambers. We can't even talk about complex stuff anymore. That does kind of stifle innovation, doesn't it? Totally. It's like the scientific world used to be open, debating ideas. Now it's all polarized, online, yelling. That's a scary thought. Like, the way we use tech is actually holding us back. And this is what worldwide oh yeah the book's argument is we're losing ground globally because of this seriously if we don't change other countries they'll pass us up like who well think china they're all in on ai right now if that that takes off we're in trouble economically geopolitically the whole nine yards okay so pretty high stakes here but the book offers solutions right not just doom and gloom oh absolutely some really interesting ones too lay it on me okay one is venture funds but specifically for dual use technologies stuff that helps both military and civilians dual use huh yeah think of it like uh the interstate highway system built for the fence originally but don't completely change how we travel how business works exactly that but for the 21st century love that so big impactful stuff what else gotta protect research from you know bias let scientists actually follow the data not political agendas or whatever oh yeah that's a big one these days and policies that balance uh you know entrepreneurship and national interest innovation and security we can have both so it's like a whole system you got to be looking at everything it really makes you think you know what's tech's role in all this that's what the book wants you to ask it does but here's a question for you listening the book's about governments big companies what can we do hmm good question right Maybe it's supporting STEM education, pushing our politicians, or even just how we use tech ourselves. Small acronyms. That you can add up to something big. If any of this got you thinking, definitely check out The Technological Republic. Eye-opening, for sure. It is. Thanks for joining us for another deep dive. We'll catch you next time. See ya. Keep exploring, keep questioning, and remember, the future is in our hands.